Chapter 7 The next morning, dawn is clear and warm. Captain Smith is back in chains and the gallows sits ready. Reverend Hunt calls for us together for Sunday services. We meet, gathered around the tree where Captain Smith is chained so that he can join us. Reverend Hunt's sermon goes on for hours. I think maybe he will not stop until every single one of us has promised never to sin again. He tells us to, that to lie is a sin and that any man who lies for his own gain and does not repent will spend eternity in the agony of hell flames. He looks right at Master Wingfield and Captain, Captain Ratliff delivering his sermon with passion. I see Master Wingfield squirm and Captain Ratcliffe sets his jaw and scares straight ahead. Captain Newport looks at the two of them and shakes his head. I send up a prayer that Reverend Hunt's sermon will save Captain Smith from its hanging. After services, I bring Captain Smith some food. I wonder if it will be his last meal. Yet, he's calm. I've been a prisoner before and I escaped before, he says. When I was a soldier fighting the Turks of the Ottoman Empire, I was captured and made a slave. They shaved my head and put an iron ring around my neck and brought me to an auction to be sold like an animal. James and Richard are nearby and they come closer to listen. The other slaves told me it was useless to try and escape. Impossible, they said. But one day we were working in the fields and I was thrashing wheat with a thrashing bat. My master rode up on horseback with his whip and cracked the whip, brought it down on my naked back and cut my skin open. I was enraged. I took my thrashing bat in both hands and swung. He swings his arms as if knocking down the cruel master from his horse once again. Down he came and before he could get his footing, I cracked the bat over his head. Then I beat him with the stub until there was no life left in him. No wonder Captain Smith is unafraid of these pale, weak gentlemen and their threats. If he wants to, he will kill them, kill them with his bare hands. Then I shucked off the slave rags, put my master's clothes on, and rode off on his horse to my freedom. Captain Smith finishes his story. The three of us boys are silent. I admire his courage and admire the way he talks about back to the gentlemen as if they have no right to lord it over him. I've never known another common, commoner who had the nerve to do that. Reverend Hunt comes marching up a ring of keys dangling. He takes the keys to the clamps on the captain's ankles. I've convinced them that without you as a translator, we will all perish in Virginia, he says, as he takes the clamps off and they fall away. Why, thank you, Reverend, Captain Smith says, rubbing his ankles. I owe you a favor. Reverend Hunt gives him a stern look. This is the favor I want, then. I want you to at least act like you have proper respect for these gentlemen. If you insult them and anger them again, they might move their pride over to survival in the new world. Captain Smith nods, and I wonder if he really does plan to be polite to exalt the gentleman from here on in. He is at least as stubborn as I am, so I know it will be hard for him to change. That afternoon, the sound of chopping wood rings over the rumbling of waves. The gallows is caught up and thrown on the fire, where it nicely roasts over our fish for supper. After six days on Nevis, I'm fatter. The birds are so tame, we pluck them out of the bushes with our hands, and the sea is teeming with fish, and the trees are full of fruit. The only natives on the island are afraid of us, and they stay well hidden. I am also cleaner. I have gone twice to the hot pools and the forest to ba bathe, but now Captain Newport says it's time to leave. We pack up the tents and cook pots, barrels we have filled with fresh water, meat and fish we have dried for the rest of our voyage, and crates full of pineapples, mangoes, plantains, coconuts, and wild bird eggs. We sail past the Spanish islands off the Vequi and Puerto Rico. We stop on the island of Mona just long enough to get fresh water and for a group of gentlemen to go hunting. They leave in the morning, taking a few soldiers with them for protection from the natives. They dress as if they are going pheasant hunting on a cool English morning, in silk doublets, velvet breeches, stockings, shoes, and felt hats with their powdered flasks hanging at their side. The group returns in the evening, exhausted and faint, carrying what the expedition has killed. Two boars, several iguanas, and the gentleman, Edward Brooks. They say that Brooks' fat melted inside his body in the extreme heat. Captain Smith has had a few choice words to say about gentlemen who are too ignorant to know that they should carry enough water on a six-mile hike in the tropics, and too ignorant to take off their extra clothing when they get hot. But this time he is wise as if not to say anything, where any of the gentlemen can hear him anyway. I did not know Edward Brooks well. He was a passenger on one of the ships. Still, it is strange to see his pale, waxy skin and his limbs stiff with death. They dig a shallow grave for Master Brooks, and we sail away, leaving them there on Mona. I have dreams that night that the cannibals find his body, dig him up, and eat him. I awake in a cold sweat. I try to calm down, reminding myself that this could not possibly happen. No one digs up a grave for food. Do they? <laughs>